Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. He is good as mercy endures for everlasting. Can we just put our hands together and bless the name of the Lord in this place? On tonight as we gather in this AME Ministerial Alliance of Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and vicinity, formerly known as the Preacher's Meeting, we gather tonight to give God praise for what the Lord has done in this place all the way back into the 1780s. I invite you tonight to join us in helping to spread the word by going to your social media. Look for uh, Mother Bethel on Facebook. If you just do facebook.com uh, forward slash Mother Bethel, it should pop right up and hit the share button. Be an evangelist, a digital evangelist. If you're on YouTube and you have a way of sharing that, it is also there under Mother Bethel or on the Mother Bethel website, motherbethelame.org. You can also zoom this out using the picture that's on the front of your program. Now, won't you join, our, join me in welcoming our worship leader on this evening, the Reverend Carlos Bounds, who will come and lead us in worship. Come on, let's put our hands together for Reverend Bounds. Amen. Come on and give God the best praise that you have. Come on, let's let the Lord know we want him here. And by letting him know we want him here, we worship him and we give him the best of our praise. How many glad that God allowed you to rise up and to see another day? Amen. Isn't that a reason to give God the best of your praise, allowing you to safely arrive here, uh, not to be able to slip and slide around in the snow this morning, but we're here and we come to lift up the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glad to see each and every one of you. Just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I just need you to be a worshiper. I just need you to be a worshiper. Amen. Um, at this time, we will now have um, our organ prelude followed by a call to worship, and the program will proceed as printed. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Called to worship, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where your honor dwells. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.
God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou, the creator, the one and only who has brought us thus far along this way. Let us bow our heads and humble our hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you first for this day. And even though there was snow and a briskness in the air, we thank you that you kept us, that you reminded us that it's another day we're in the land of the living God. And you allowed us to gather together and to assemble in this place tonight, God, a place set aside so many years ago, God, to worship and praise your name. And then, God, we thank you that we come to encourage, God, one of our brothers, one who was standing on the shoulders of the many, many, many that came before him. So, Father, we ask, God, that you would just be in this service, God. We pray, Lord, that the word that comes forth, God, would encourage, would equip, would enlighten and empower us. We ask, God, that the worship would uplift us, God, and remind us that although we're hearing so many things in the news and the media, wars and rumors of wars, God, remind us that while some men trust in chariots and some men trust in horses, we trust in your name. And you have brought us this far. So, Father, we commit this service. We commit all things to your hands. Give us exactly what we need for pressing into place tonight. We bless you and praise you. And in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. It's in the word of God. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson is recorded in the gospel of Mark. Chapter 8, verse 34. Then move into chapter 15. 15 to 22. Reading from the new King James Version. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Chapter 15. So Pilate wanted to gratify the crowd. Release Barnabas to them. And he delivered Jesus after he had scorned him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into a hall called Paternium. And they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And then they struck him on the head with the reed and spat on him. And bowing the knees, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And then they compelled a certain man, Simeon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place, Gorthatis, which is translated the place of a skull. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good evening. I have the awesome task of stating the occasion. Now in life, there are some people we call a triple threat. They can sing they can dance, and they can act. And I'm not saying that about our honoree tonight. I would have to ask First Lady that. I'll save that for Reverend Stephanie when I have to introduce her. But tonight, we are in the city of Philadelphia on the Philadelphia District within the Philadelphia Conference with our own Triple P. Now let me tell you about our Triple P. He's a Triple P, P, because he preaches the unadulterated gospel. He's a Triple P because he speaks truth to power. He's a Triple P because he's a father, he's a husband, he's a friend that will protect you to the end. So tonight, we come to support someone who desires to present and preserve the history of African Methodism. Tonight, we come to rally around someone who shows up in the nick of time. Tonight, we come to share our gifts and cheer on our brother and our friend. Tonight, we come to tell our Triple P, we have your back to the end.
we are moving along just nicely. Richard, do we have an extra song? Yeah, let's, let's, let's get an extra one in there. Amen. together. Come on, church. Put your hands together. We come to worship him. To bless his name on tonight. Trust him. I'm 
come on, put those blessed hands together for the AME Mass Choir. Come on. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Y'all can do better than that. Praise the Lord for the rest of my life. I'll praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We'd certainly be remiss if we didn't introduce our president of the Women's Missionary Society for the First Episcopal District. Come on, say amen. 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 And Sister Wanda Ringgold, and we certainly recognize the, the presence of the First Lady here uh, at Mother Bethel, Sister Leslie Tyler. And also the First Lady of Mount Airy Church of God in Christ, Evangelist Felton. We certainly recognize our, our clergy colleagues who are here, uh, as well as Sister Sue Butler there, YPD for the First Episcopal District. Those of you who are watching on Facebook or, or YouTube, you, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, it gives us great joy. I mean, we're excited about the night. We're excited about, somebody say excited. We're excited about the, tonight. We've come here, as Reverend Capers had mentioned, to support our brother uh, and our sister uh, in their pursuit of higher office in our church. And we know what's going to happen. Okay. So we're here with mixed feelings because we certainly going to miss them. Okay. But we certainly want to see them elevated uh, as well. And so when we had a chance to talk with Pastor Tyler uh, about tonight, so many things are going on. Uh, tomorrow being Ash Wednesday, we just coming out of Founders Day. Uh, but we wanted to have this service of, of encouragement. And I asked him, did you want to preach? And he said, well, if I don't have to, I said, no, you don't have to. I said, can you tell us who you would like to preach? And he mentioned Bishop Felton. who is our honorary AME bishop. And so we were just overjoyed when Bishop Felton agreed. Now, I printed out a real long bio, and all of it is true. But for those of us who are here in Philadelphia, we're just excited that this man from Kalamazoo, Michigan, found a not robbery to come here, plant himself at Mount Airy, but became a servant of the city. So you can't go anywhere in Philadelphia and not know Bishop J. Lewis Felton. Tremendous preacher, but I think he is even a greater servant. And so we're just excited about having him here. We're excited about having the Mount Erie uh, family here with us on this night. Um, we know him as your, your pastor and your, your servant leader. We know him as the first vice president of the Philadelphia NAACP. We know him as the newly installed president of the black clergy of Philadelphia and vicinity. We shared together on the board at Lutheran Theological Seminary, but tonight he comes to preach. And so we are here to hear a word from the Lord. Somebody say, preach, preacher. Oh, preach, preacher. Preach, preacher. After another selection by the AME Mass Choir, 
Diane, just come on now. Another selection by the AME Mass Choir. My friends back there. The next voice you will hear after the singing of the choir is that of our preacher of the evening, Bishop J. Lewis Felton. Hear ye him as God speaks through him to us.
for the things which he has done, for this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. We thank God for Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Let's celebrate this great church. Thank God for Mother Bethel. Of course, that means that we are all the children of Mother Bethel and we have come home tonight to celebrate our heritage, for God has made us one. Amen? You may be seated. Thank you, Reverend Albert Johnson, for that very kind and gracious introduction. And of course, uh, we thank God for your leadership as president of the AME Ministerial Alliance of Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and vicinity. And certainly we celebrate the pastor of this historic church and the next historiographer of the AME Church, Reverend Dr. Mark Kelly Tyler. And certainly we thank God for First Lady, God bless you, First Lady Tyler, and all of these wonderful ministers and this great choir that has blessed our hearts tonight. Mount Airy is here. Will you stand, Mount Airy, Church of God in Christ? Amen. Amen. We thank God for our deacons who are front and center and uh, our officers, each of you, our first lady. Uh, will you stand? We appreciate. Let them, you're not as tall as Miss Tyler, so that's right. Stand up. <laughs> God bless our first lady. And, uh, of course, Raquel is here, our granddaughter. We're going to hear from her a little later. Now, Dr. Mark Tyler is the pastor of Mother Bethel and candidate for historiographer. So why don't we read from the book of Mark? St. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. St. Mark chapter 15. Verses 15 through 22. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple, and planted a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him, and they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, 
who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for surrounding us with so great a cloud of witnesses. We are sensitive to the fact that in the supernatural, we are able to connect with the unseen. And even though we can't see the great cloud of witnesses, we know that they are there. And we sense their presence. We thank you for their prayers. We thank you that they have laid such a strong foundation upon which we stand. Tonight, as we worship with the invisible, with the intangible, we pray that your presence will move in such a way that we will never forget this night and we will never be the same again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. For the sake of emphasis, Mark 15, 21, and they compel one Simon who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Let us reason together for a few moments from this subject the black man's cross. Will you say that with me? The black man's cross. Thanks be to God for this very powerful spiritual intersection at which God has placed us. The eve of Ash Wednesday and the eve of the birth of Bishop Richard Allen. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform, plants his footsteps on the seas, rides upon the storm. God, in fulfilling his purpose, often places things within an inexplicable trajectory. He makes things happen that we never thought would happen in the way that they do. Even today we experience that when it is as though a blizzard broke out this morning. And when you get that much snow, that fast it plays with your mind. It makes you wonder if you should maintain the same schedule and agenda that you have put in place. But the Lord meant for us to be here tonight. And inasmuch as God has brought us together on this night, we are sensitive to the fact that even upon these grounds are interred the bones of Bishop Richard Allen, which means that there is no more sacred place in America than the place whereon we stand. These are holy grounds. The oldest parcel of ground owned by African Americans in this country. And inasmuch as the Lord has willed it that we be at Mother Bethel, what better launching pad can there be to historiographer? than the pastor of the most historic piece of property for African Americans in the United States. For the fact that there is a Mother Bethel AME church is a living testimony to the fact that judgment must begin at the house of God. It is not that Bishop Richard Allen sought to begin a new congregation, that was not what he had 
in mind. But the fact of the matter is that you haven't really been hurt until you've been hurt in church. You've never been wounded until you've been wounded in the house of God. But those wounds and pains and hurts really signify the fact that God had made Bishop Richard Allen pregnant with promise. And we might need to unpack that because some people may not be on the level of embracing the notion of God making a man pregnant. But the fact is, the first person that ever got pregnant was a man. He didn't know he was pregnant, but after the Lord put him under anesthesia and did a C-section on him, Adam realized that God had placed someone within him. For when the Lord brought him back to consciousness, he said, she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And you can't get somebody out of a place where they've never been before. How is it that Adam didn't even know he was pregnant? Well, let's understand that when you live for God, when you walk, with God, when you sleep with God, God plants something inside of you. <laughs> Blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. But your delight is in the law of the Lord, and when you meditate in his law day and night, he will make you like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, and because of his intimacy with you, he will plant something in you so that you can bring it forth. When God plants a seed in you, it's because he intends to bring it to term and birth it through you. Only God can birth what God conceives within you. Because God in making the first Adam pregnant, realize that he could not complete his plan for humanity in the first Adam. So if he makes the first Adam pregnant, he has to make the second Adam pregnant. And the second Adam knew he was pregnant because when Jesus is on the cross of Calvary, and when he's under this intense pain, this excruciating misery, that he cries out even in the hymn of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus knew that he was pregnant because even before he got to the cross, Satan tried to abort what he was carrying. Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, but while he was praying, the supernatural struggle became so intense that the enemy tried to kill Jesus before he got to the cross. He knew what was going to happen if Jesus ever got to Calvary. If I can kill him now, then I may be able to escape what will ultimately happen at Golgotha, and he tried desperately to kill Jesus, which is why Jesus began to hyperventilate. He sweat blood, and as he sweat blood, it was obvious that he was so wounded within that even though there were no nails yet in his hands and feet, no crown of thorns yet upon his brow, no spear yet in his side, but he was still bleeding. And any time you become so wounded internally that you bleed profusely, it is because the enemy is trying to kill what God is birthing through you. 
And that is why as Jesus prays until sweat comes down, there's great drops of blood, he has to have reinforcement. Because this supernatural struggle is of such that Jesus practically collapses under the weight of this pressure. That is why he did not ask the disciples, pray with me one hour, but watch with me one hour. I know you're not ready to endure the attacks that I'm getting ready to have. It'll kill you, but somehow God's going to keep me alive. I've got to make it to Calvary. I'm going to be wounded before I even get arrested. I'm already bleeding. I'm already internally damaged, but I've got to make it to Calvary. Because at Calvary, I'm going to give conception uh, to what God has placed within me. And look at how God duplicates in the second Adam what he does in the first Adam. He put the first Adam in a deep sleep. And there are many things that God can only communicate to us subconsciously. Subconscious conversations are the ones in which the flesh cannot engage in such a struggle against God. God knows how to get your attention. He knows how to get your submission. And he often does it subconsciously. And while the first Adam is subconscious, that's when he realizes what he has within him. You understand, education is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week enterprise. You can learn a lot of things while you're asleep. Because God can cut it into your subconscious mind. Joseph before he went to sleep, said he wasn't going to marry Mary. But while he was asleep, the conversation that he had with God was so profound that when he woke up, wedding bells were ringing. There's some things God won't tell you while you are awake. He only cuts it into your spirit with that sharper than two-edged sword while you are subconscious. It's spirit to spirit and soul to soul. And when God communicates and births something in you subconsciously, then your conscious cannot stop it from happening. And that is why when God places the first Adam in a deep sleep, he has to do it in the second Adam. I'm not going to let Jesus give birth while he's conscious. I'm going to put him in a deeper sleep then I put the first Adam. The first Adam only has an anesthetic kind of sleep under God's ether. But the second Adam died. His sleep is so profound that he has to give birth in death. That reminds us of how vulnerable that he was that he dies in childbirth. While Jesus is dead... That's when the spear goes in his side. That's when his water breaks. That's when blood and water flows from his side. That's when the church is conceived. And it's obvious that he's not ready to bear this child to complete fulfillment of the pregnancy because I'm going to get killed before I can do it. So I'm going to have to put it on life support. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so, Father, while I go to hell, while I preach to the spirits in prison, while I minister proactively, you keep my baby on life support until I get up on the third day morning. Yes, God made Richard Allen pregnant and the labor pains were that while he's praying, that's when he's being evicted from St. George's. And then God brings the pregnancy to term as he goes to a blacksmith shop and hitches a team of mules to a blacksmith shop and drags it to where we are tonight at 6th and Lombard. I'm glad that if you sleep with God, he will 
make you pregnant. Because the Bible says you will bring forth your fruit in your season. You can't bring forth fruit if you don't have a seed in you. Man or woman, when God puts a seed in you, you will bring it forth. Come on, help me give God some praise here tonight. So then, let us observe the manner in which God makes this connection. He has made pregnant the first Adam, and he has made pregnant the second Adam. But tradition is, according to Origen, the great church father who lives in the second century A.D., he cites the fact that local people believe that Adam was buried at Golgotha. In fact, it was said that his skull was found at Calvary. Look at this connection between the first Adam and the second Adam, that he would be buried in this ugly place called the place of the skull, and that Jesus would be crucified in this place. Look at the connection that God makes because in the first Adam, we sinned, but in the second Adam, we're declared righteous. In the first Adam, we died, but in the second Adam, we are resurrected. In the first Adam, we got sick, but in the second Adam, we got a prescription that puts our sins in remission because he was wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our pieces upon him, and with his stripes, I am healed. No wonder it is that Mark writes this first gospel chronologically with a perspective that resonates with African Americans. For when he talks about the cross of Christ in Mark 15, 21, there are four black men in this verse. There is Simon of Cyrene in northern Africa, and there are the sons of Simon, Alexander, and Rufus. And then there is a fourth black man whose cross Simon is bearing. Look at God putting four black men in one verse in connection with the cross of Christ. What is it about the Christ that God wants him to identify with the black man? Obviously, when you read Isaiah 53, God is writing this letter to a black man so that as he reads it in his chariot going back to Ethiopia, he realizes that 700 years in advance, God wanted an Ethiopian to become the father of Coptic Christianity. What is it about black men that God gravitates toward them so much? You understand that we already had this relationship with Christianity before we came to America. We didn't come to America to meet Christ. We not only knew Christ, we are Christ as far as Africanness is concerned. Jesus is a black Jesus. You don't go to Africa and hide from Herod unless you blend in with the Africans. Jesus has blackness all in him and through him. He's there in the Garden of Eden in as much as he prepares it and creates it. You can't read the Bible without getting the fact that this whole thing is born and bred and perpetuated through Africanness. Wouldn't even have a Bible if it wasn't for Africa. God raises up an African-born man with an African name, Moses, though he has Hebrew blood 
in his veins. He has Africanness in his consciousness. He is discovered and saved by an African princess who names him, having taken him from the longest river on the planet, the Nile River, 4,160 miles long. It is this African connection that she lifts up when she says, I drew him out of the water. It is this African-born man who gives us the foundation, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You wouldn't have a Pentateuch if it hadn't been for an African-born man. The fact is, Africanness is what God puts at the center of the biblical narrative which is why we know that the sin of white supremacy that would even take a black God and make him white, what greater theft is there that you would try to change God himself? That's an anthropomorphism that is stretched beyond recognition. The true and living God, Jesus Christ, chooses to be born among the oppressed. He chooses to be hated. He chooses poverty over wealth. He chooses homelessness over establishment. He chooses hatred over love. Though he was rich, he became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. Jesus is the classic example of how to bear the cross. Yes, Simon shows up just in time. The Lord would not let him arrive while Jesus is giving the seminar on the mount. The Lord won't let him show up while Jesus is feeding 5,000 with two small fish and five barley loaves. God won't let Simon show up when Jesus is stilling a tempest. Peace be still. He won't let Simon show up when Jesus is upon the mount of transfiguration. God won't let Simon show up when Jesus is healing the sick, opening blinded eyes, raising the dead. Simon doesn't show up until it's cross-bearing time. Why is it that God won't let Simon meet Jesus until it's time to bear the cross? Isn't that unfair? He's never heard you preach Jesus, he's never seen you perform a miracle. He has not experienced your kingdom teaching. He's never even experienced your compassion. He doesn't even meet you until it's time to get under the cross. Well, the song is, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. And I'm glad that God brought this black brother in just in time to get under the cross. Because that means that he is destined for promotion. No cross, no crown. I want to be so sure that you get a crown that I'm going to introduce you at the place of death. The place of suffering, the place of denial, the place of rejection. The fact is, Jesus teaches us how to deal with rejection. Jesus teaches us how to deal with being hated, for he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, most people don't want to meet grief and sorrow. They don't want to be introduced. And even if there is an introduction, they don't want to shake hands with grief and sorrow. But grief and sorrow were saying, I didn't want to shake hands with you anyway. I want a hug. Grief and sorrow want to saturate our lives. Jesus says, if you just got to do it, hug me first. Before you hug anybody else. Before you squeeze anybody else, squeeze me. Because I am a man of sorrows. I am acquainted with grief. To be acquainted with grief means Jesus knows how to handle grief. Some people, grief unravels their lives. Grief saps their equilibrium. 
but somehow Jesus knew how to deal with grief. Jesus understands I can have joy in the midst of sorrow. Jesus understands how to smile when he feels like crying. Who else but Jesus, while he's standing before Pilate, being mocked and about to be scourged, never loses his cool. For Pilate wants him to know, man, you better talk to me because I can get you off from this. You really don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die such a shameful and excruciating death. But Jesus tells him, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world to bear witness of the truth. Pilate, if I didn't want to be here, I wouldn't be here. All I have to do is pray one prayer. My father will give me more than 12 legions of angels. I really don't need that many, but I just want you to know the power of prayer. I could do it with one angel, but a prayer will give me 12 legions of angels. I know I can do it with one angel because I've done it with one angel before. When Sennacherib surrounded Jerusalem, Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and God gives him only one angel. And in just one night, that angel kills 185,000 men. Now that's the kind of army I command. I know you've got me handcuffed. I know you have a scourge ready for me. You've already spit in my face. You have dehumanized me, but you don't know what kind of army I command. I can pray right now and everything will be wiped out. For Jesus said I can get 12 legions. One legion for me and one legion for my 11 loyal disciples. Judas has already committed suicide. I can get 12 legions. That's 72,000 angels. Each angel has the ability at least to kill 185,000 men. All I got to do is pray. And 13 billion with a B men would be wiped out with just one prayer. There's not enough blood for me to shed. Even right this minute in 2024, we don't have 13 billion people on the planet. Jesus said, why waste my army when they don't have enough blood to shed? I know how to deal with grief. I know how to handle rejection. I know that though weeping endures for a night, joy comes in the morning. I know that this is my season for rejection. This is my season to be hated. This is my season to go to the cross. And when you know that trouble don't last always, when you know that God will fight your battles, God will open doors no one can shut. When you know that God will make you the head and not the tail, you can handle grief and sorrows. Who knows that better than us? We're in a strange land, but we didn't stop singing like the Hebrews. The Hebrews said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We came to a strange land, but we just sang a strange song. We sang songs like, I love the Lord, he heard my cry, and pitied every groan. Long as I live, while trouble rise, oh, I'll hasten unto his throne. We sang songs like, before this time, another year, I may be dead and gone. We sang songs like, far by stretch, my hands to thee, nor the help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, whither shall I go? If you're in a strange land, don't stop singing, don't stop praying, don't stop worshiping, just sing 
a strange song. Sing word in the water because God's going to show the water. Sing steal away to Jesus. Oh Lord, because the trumpet sounds way down in my soul. And when the trumpet sounds in my soul, I know I ain't got long to stay here. We sang a strange song like southern trees bear strange fruit. Black bodies swinging from the limbs, but we kept on singing. If you sing in sorrow, if you sing in tragedy, if you sing in the storm, after a while God will give you a new song. God won't forget you. God won't leave you. God won't forsake you. He'll give you a song like amazing grace. How sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Oh, upon now I see. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a new song. Now I have a song the angels can't sing. I've been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Come on and touch somebody and tell them I've been redeemed. Oh Lord, so glad I've been redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yeah, oh yes, I know I've been redeemed. He picked me up and turned me around, set my feet on solid ground, brought me out with a mighty hand. I know. I've been changed Looked at my hands Hands look new Looked at my feet They did too Started to walk Had a new walk Started to talk Had a new talk I know I've been changed I know I've been redeemed Oh, I know Jesus is real to me. Anybody know he's real? Oh, he's real. Thank God for Jesus bearing the cross, the cross of rejection, the cross of racism, the cross of discrimination, the cross of annihilation. Jesus bore the cross, but I need somebody to get under the cross with me. Come here, black man. Oh, Lord, I want you to show up when it's cross-bearing time. I don't know why that Henry Highland Garnett doesn't show up until it's cross-bearing time. Marcus Garvey shows up at cross-bearing time. Frederick Douglass shows up at cross-bearing time. Roy Wilkins shows up at cross-bearing time. Medgar Evers shows up at cross-bearing time. Emmett Till shows up at cross-bearing time. Martin Luther King shows up at cross-bearing time. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? All the world go free. No! Oh, no! There is a cross for everyone. Oh, there's a cross for me. I'm so glad God will give you grace to bear your cross. God will give you strength to bear the cross. Even when you get weak, even when you stumble, even when you fall down, he'll give you grace to bear your cross. When the time is right, God will show up and show out. Yes, he will. Oh, yes, he will. God will show up and show out. I want you to know, Dr. Mark Tyler, 
it's cross-bearing time. You in a pressure cooker, you in a heated campaign in Atlanta this morning for the funeral of Dr. Dolly Adams, you know what it means to bear the cross. You've been touched by the spirit of Allen. You've been anointed with a special double portion from God. You've been prepared before you were born. God has chosen you. God has put his hands on you. God is with you. God is for you. And if God be for us, oh, who can be against us? Come on and help me give God some praise. Thank God for this vessel. Thank God for his destiny. He's got his cross. He's going through. He's been in the valley of the shadow of death. But don't fear anything. Don't fear anybody. Don't fear the poles. Don't fear the haters. Don't fear the opposition. God plus one is the majority. You need more than votes. You need God. And God is on your side. God is in you. God is for you. God is through you. God's all over you. God is around you. Go ahead, man. God has a way for you that no one can destroy. If you bear the cross, God will give you a crown. Come on and shake hands with somebody and tell them, I shall wear a crown when the trumpet sounds, when the shout of God is made, I shall wear a crown. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for my heavenly home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eyes on the sparrow. I knew he watches Dr. Mark Tyler. His eyes on the sparrow. I know he's watching Mother Bethel. His eyes on the sparrow. I know he's watching over the AME church. He's watching over Philadelphia. Touch somebody and say he's watching over you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He will keep his promise. Say yes. Say yes. Jesus bore the cross. Jesus went into hell. Jesus preached a revival in hell. Jesus led a real parade. That ain't no parade in New Orleans, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo. That ain't no parade. Jesus led captivity captive. Principalities and powers made a show of them openly and said, all power of heaven and earth is given unto me. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. This is our party. This is our day. We are victorious. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Let's give him glory. Somebody help me give him glory. Let's give him glory. Hallelujah. 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 Help me shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. The doors of the church are open. If you bear the cross, you shall wear the crown. No cross, no crown. Thank you, Dr. Mark Tyler, for being the vessel that God has anointed. And I want you to know God's not through with you yet. I see you in the future. And you look even better than you do right now. Can you help me celebrate this great man of God who we've come to encourage tonight? Surrounded by the spirit of Allen. 
We thank God. Let us pray. Father, we bless your name. We thank you for your presence. You have validated this moment. You have set your seal upon it. We thank you tonight that we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are encouraged to go all the way. For we are the living history of our people. Even when we can't say it, all we got to do is show up. And when we show up, our very blackness and essence testifies that we not only survive, but we thrive. That God has kept us alive and wouldn't let the enemy destroy us. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody help me tell him thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood for your sufficient grace in Jesus' name. Come on, Raquel. The door is open. There may be somebody tonight who wants to meet this Jesus who teaches us to bear the cross victoriously. say amen. Let the people of God say hallelujah. Oh, let the people of God say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, did Bishop preach our souls happy? Ajene, I know you're going to get that in one of your Bible studies how he made a man pregnant. Amen. 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 We certainly want to thank Bishop Felton tonight for just coming and blessing us. 
and encouraging our brother. It's offering time, amen? Oh, it's offering time, amen? We are taking up one offering tonight. One offering tonight. We came to fellowship, celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but we also come as a symbol of encouragement for Pastor Tyler and Sister Leslie as they are embarking on this journey. And it takes a lot to campaign. You know, he's, he has to crisscross throughout the, the country. Okay, it takes a lot to campaign. And we just want to help him. Somebody say help him. We, we want to help him, and we're not bashful about asking for it. It's just one offering tonight. One offering tonight. And what we take up tonight is for Pastor Tyler to help him on his way. Now, the checks, if you're writing a check, is made payable to the AME Ministerial Alliance of Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and vicinity. But if you get AME Ministerial Alliance on there, it's good. Or AME Preachers Meeting. Okay. So you make it payable to them. Those of you who are on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, you make your checks payable to the AME Ministry Alliance, or you can cash app. Those of you who have a program in front of you is dollar sign AME PHL Preachers. And I believe those of you online will be able to see that. Okay. We are asking for $50 tonight. $50 tonight. Don't get quiet. $50 tonight. Now, if that's not the street you live on, it's all right. Okay. But if you can, if you can, and then for those who don't mind going a little beyond, we're asking 100 we're asking 100 because we're trying to help our brother get someplace. Amen. So I have 100 from Vivian and myself, and I have 100 from Mount Tabor. We have 100 from the bishop, and you come on. Tell us story. On behalf of the Philadelphia Annual Conference Ministry of Evangelism, we're presenting 500. Oh, come on, come on, come on. We, we, we in a good space right now. We're in a good space right now. So we're going to ask our preachers if you can come on down. 50, 100, wherever you are living at, it's okay. It's okay. Amen. Thank you. Several preachers have already sent. I know I heard from uh, Reverend Brooks. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Elder. Oh, I was reminded, Mount Erie, we are going to take care of your pastor. Okay. But this offering is for to help Pastor Tyler. Amen. Come on. From the Philadelphia Amy Mass Choir, $200. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do I have any other $50 givers in here? If not, why don't we stand? We are, and those who haven't had the opportunity, whatever you have is fine. It's right there on your, your program. AME PHL, dollar sign, AME PHL Preachers. You can just come on down, wherever you're at, you can just come on down. You can just come on down. Again, those of you who are online. On behalf of my pastor, I want to announce $150 from Campbell Amy Church in Franklin. Amen, $150 from Campbell, amen. If you're online and you're giving by way of Cash App, it's dollar sign AME PHL Preachers. Praise the 
Praise the Lord. Thank you, my brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. And if you're online and you want to send a check, you can make that check again, payable to AME Ministerial Alliance, and you can send it to Bethel AME Church Ardmore. That's 160. 163 Sheldon Lane, 19003. There you go. There you go. Amen. Has everyone had an opportunity to give? Amen. Yes, come on down, sis. Preside Nelda Lett gave 100 online, and Preside Nelda Lovelace and Brother Eddie gave $200 online. To God be the glory. Reverend Jaquita Wright Henderson, 100, Metropolitan 100, Amen. Reverend Tiffany Martin, our pastor out in Westchester 100, Reverend Catherine Brooks, Bethel Bristol, $100. Dr. Patricia McAllister, Mike Zion, Columbia. Amen. And several other churches. To God be the glory. Come on, let's give God some praise. All things come of thee, O Lord. you all so much for sharing. Those of you who are online, uh, we will continue uh, to collect for, for Pastor Tyler. So if you didn't have the opportunity tonight, there will be other opportunities. Uh, and additionally, we also have the Reverend Vernon Bird Jr., who's running for bishop, uh, and we'll be doing something for him uh, in April. Come on, let's give God some praise. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy and righteous name. Let me first of all say on behalf of Leslie and myself how appreciative we are. Uh, Reverend Johnson has been trying to do something for some time, and, um, you know, a, a part of, uh, I think I wanted to wait until I got too close to the uh, deadline to get out. Somebody say, man, we're at the cutoff. And you know, I have to be honest, a part of uh, my back and forth is how much I love this place. And uh, how much I love all of you in this conference and um, my siblings from other uh, congregations like Mount Airy in this city um, we came here 20 years ago in 2004 to the area. I was a Ph.D. student at uh, University of Dayton, and I just finished coursework. And Leslie was a, a very high-achieving news executive uh, that a lot of, uh, let's just say, stations that have color issues in Ohio 
didn't want to give her what she was worth. And so she sacrificed those two years while I was uh, in coursework, and someone had called her and offered her a job in Philly right before my last year in coursework, and I, she said, well, I can't do it. The next year came around, and I was going to be a candidate, which meant I could write from anywhere. And the same person called back and said, can you come out to Philly? Fox 29, uh, she came out as the assistant news director. And um, so I reached out to, to the seminary world and New Brunswick Seminary, never heard of it, in New Jersey. Had a job that they said they'd been trying to fill, offered it to three people and nobody took it. Absolutely perfect. And we moved here Labor Day weekend, 2004, with a little newborn Madison and uh, knew nobody, really. And we both started work that Tuesday. Now, I want to say to the brothers here who say, I never follow my wife nowhere. Well, I followed her here and ended up in Mother Bethel. So I just want to say, um, <laughs> so don't ever get so hooked into, I mean, well, you did just talk about brother getting pregnant. So, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm just telling you, let me just say, like, what a blessing. When we came here, God has just exceeded our expectations. Uh, six wonderful months at Westchester, at Bethel, and four and a half great years at Macedonia and Camden, and then the last 16 years, uh, almost 16 years here at Mother Bethel. Uh, it has just been amazing. If I was trying to get here, it would have never happened. But it really happened because of my love for AME history. I fell in love. I'd always loved history, but in my dissertation process, I was writing on Bishop Daniel Payne. And the folk in Macedonia, poor members of Macedonia, they got more of Daniel Payne or as much of Daniel Payne as they got about Jesus on Sunday mornings. I f ran out of ways of preaching about Daniel Payne and this, this wonderful story. But uh, it, it was the first time I ran for historiographer. It was in 2008. And I did not win against uh, Dr. Dickerson, who had held the position over 20 years. But Bishop Norris saw something in that run and in me. And who knew that Bishop Leith was going to get elected bishop in 08? Folk were saying he would never get elected. And as soon as he was in, um, it just kind of felt like the whole church looked my way. And I said, well, what makes sense never happens. And I wrote it off for four months. This church was empty. And when he made the appointment, uh, I tell you, he just blessed us in ways that we cannot um, begin to tell you. And so I want to just simply say how much I appreciate the relationships that we have made in this city and forged. And we're looking forward, if God has it uh, in God's plans, for this to happen in August in Columbus, to begin to do even greater things with our history. I've been saying all along, we've done now five documentaries on the AME Church. Uh, you can find them on YouTube, the Bishop Richard Allen story, stories about our general conference and other uh, important pieces. But uh, we also need a full-length motion picture about Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and Sarah Allen and Jarena Lee and those folk like James Fortin and others whose shoulders we stand on in this neighborhood. And this position can make something like that happen. We also need to continue to push and promote our history, not for ourselves alone, but for our children who are coming up behind us. In fact, let me tell you, I first met Bishop Felton. Um, President Johnson wanted to know, who I wanted to preach, and some people may have said, why didn't you get an A&E? But we were hosting a meeting in 2015, I believe, here at Mother Bethel. We hosted a series of organizing meetings for that 7,000-person march following the summer that killed Mike Brown in Ferguson and Brandon Tate Brown in Philadelphia. And somebody came. Uh, we were here every Sunday night, um, about 100 or 200 people planning that meeting, that march. And they said, oh, the new pastor at Mount Airy, Church of God in Christ, is down in the Richard Allen Museum. We weren't even open. They said, but he's down there and uh, wanted to know if he could go see it. Were you there with him? That's what I thought. His granddaughter was there. I told you. I, I, and his wife. And, and I said, the pastor at Mount Airy? I think I had kind of missed the transition. And um, so Bishop Morris I said, no, 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 the new pastor. I said, okay. I went downstairs, introduced myself, and the man from Kalamazoo started telling me about our history and talked about this is, as he said, this is ground zero 
for the independent black church movement, and he wanted his grandchildren and the visitors with him from Kalamazoo to see where Richard Allen was buried. And for his love and his appreciation for our story, I will always celebrate this, brother. Can we celebrate Bishop J. Lewis Felton, president of Black Clergy of Philadelphia, pastor of Mount Airy, Church of God in Christ, honorary African Methodist member. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Look, I'm going to let you get out of here, I promise, but I, I do have to just say a few things. To Pastor Johnson, again, thank you, and thank you to the AME Ministers, Ministerial Alliance and to the Preachers Meeting for all of what you have done, for the people who have put money in our pockets along the way. Uh, many of you know who you are. Thank you again to uh, the Evangelist, uh, Reverend Capers, and to the AME Mass Choir, not just for singing, but bringing a gift. Thank you, Sister Marie and Sister Diane and Reverend uh, Richard. Norris the second and uh, Reverend Cavanis for doing the program and all the work behind the scenes who's also president of the interdenominational or what the main line I should know I preached the revival for three years in a row the main line of uh, preachers uh, ministerial alliance want to thank her for the leadership out there uh, as well as so Reverend Lois Wilkinson president of WIM women in ministry for the Philadelphia conference Thank you for being here, as well as others who have already been recognized. Um, Bishop McAllister could not be here because, unlike me, he actually made it to Atlanta today for the uh, home going of uh, Mother Dolly Adams, he and Mother McAllister, but he preached here yesterday, um, Sunday, and uh, told me as he was leaving to expect, a, he told me the amount as well, significant contribution on behalf of him and Mother McAllister, so I want to just say that publicly, how much we appreciate them. And then finally, uh, I preached this afternoon virtually at Methes uh, Methesco, Methodist Theological School of Ohio, where I teach for the chapel service, and I ended the sermon with, my faith looks up to thee. And when I heard the choir singing that, I said, you know, I mean, in a race like this, there are moments where you need encouragement. There are moments where you don't just need a financial gift, but somebody just to kind of keep pushing you along the way. And so I want to thank them for that song because it is encouragement for my soul that, again, if we continue to look up with faith to God, that all things are possible. Thank you, Mother Bethel folk. And, uh, man, you know I can't let you get out of here without uh, some kind of announcements. So as you leave, downstairs, Reverend Stephanie Atkins, is she already down there? Oh, there she is. Stand up, Reverend Atkins, just so I can see you. She's our pastor at Waters Memorial AME Church on South Street. You probably saw them in the paper today. Great story about the uh, first black firehouse that they own and how they're working that uh, building. But she has this downstairs, Black Faith Votes PA. This is a campaign from our work with Power Interfaith. Every congregation in here should be a 100% voting congregation. Uh, many of the churches in here have already participated, and so we want every church to have a voting captain. A church like Mount Airy probably needs several, uh, and we have stipends for them as well. And so we, want, we have a full plan. We will walk you through the year, how the voter captain engages in the congregation. We're there to support them. We're not here to tell you who to vote for. But we are certainly here to say, let us um, remember and honor the ancestors by taking uh, our rightful place at the, poll at the polls. Secondly, on tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m., there will be a press conference here that you are invited to. Uh, persons like Bishop Vashti McKenzie, uh, also Reverend Freddie Haynes, and others will be here, Reverend Stephen Green from uh, Harlem. They are marching from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., to call for a ceasefire in Gaza because children and the elderly and innocent people should never be considered collateral damage. We got to find a better way. And so we want to push our administration to be thoughtful and concerned about all persons on both sides of this horrible, horrific war in Israel and Gaza. 9.30 a.m., the press conference is open to everyone. And because it's Ash Wednesday, everyone who so shows up will receive the imposition of ashes uh, if they would like so. Uh, and then finally, uh, Philadelphia Conference trustees, this is for you, 
6 o'clock on Thursday. We have a very short meeting on Zoom. I will send that out. Sorry about that. This took the air out of somebody's balloon. Amen. It's very short. It's very easy. I promise you, you'll be on and off in 30 minutes. Amen. Thank you. Uh, President Johnson, can we give him a big hand as he comes forward to close up? Amen. We'll have God our Father and then Reverend Cabinets will come and close us out.